Chapter Twelve of Prodigal Daughters by Joseph Hawking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kate Fallis. Chapter Twelve Trevor Trelawney. On the whole, Colonel Trelawney was pleased with his son Trevor. He found him to be a tall, handsome young fellow, gentlemanly in appearance, and a smart officer his commanding officer while not enthusiastic spoke well of him and expressed the opinion that he might settle down to a capable reliable man he had borne the rank of captain during the war but after the armistice he with thousands of others had been reduced in rank the commanding officer hinted that he was inclined to take things easy and was rather extravagant although in this respect he was no worse than many others father and son had spent the day together and the colonel had been introduced to most of trev's fellow officers years before the colonel had been stationed in plymouth and it was a great delight to him to visit the scenes among which he had lived during a part of his early manhood he had thrown off the anxious thoughts which had beset him during the last few days and became quite gay trevor was very proud of his father he found that the colonel was regarded as a very big man and more than once he heard it hinted that it was quite on the carpet that he would soon be general still he did not feel quite at ease in his society there was something which he did not quite understand it was true he was genial and kindly but his every word and gesture convinced his son that he was a man who looked on anything like delinquency with a grave eye i'm sorry you have to go to ireland to-morrow remarked the colonel as the two sat in the dining-room of the hotel yes it's a bit of a nuisance assented trevor i have to go to a most ungodly hole too there are no decent people living in the district and so everything like social amenities will be cut off that's natural replied the colonel no soldier who goes to ireland in these days can have an easy time the country is practically in a state of revolution still i hope i shall get a bit of hunting i should judge not if what i hear is true i shall have a good try anyhow but how to get a decent mount will be a difficult question i shan't be able to take my own horse with me your own horse queried the colonel yes replied trevor somewhat uneasily i was obliged to get one you know i was frightfully lucky too a beautiful thing he is just rising five and hasn't a single vice i got him dirt cheap too i only bought him two days ago you see i had to decide rather in a hurry if i hadn't bought him another fellow would and i felt the bargain was too good to miss you haven't got the bill i suppose haven't got the bill i told him to send it to you told who the fellow i bought it from i don't understand of course i ought to have written but as i told you the horse was for sale dirt cheap and half a dozen fellows wanted him i've had an awful time there's some very good hunting a few miles from here and hiring horses has been bankruptcy besides some of the things i've had to ride have been just bone shakers practically no good at all that's why i bought this one and you told the man from whom you bought it to send the bill to me of course remarked trev glad as he remarked afterwards that he'd got the thing off his chest and may i ask how much you gave for it six hundred replied the son the chap asked eight but of course i wasn't going to have that still horse flesh is jolly dear and you expect me to pay for it of course replied trev coolly then let me tell you at once my boy that i can't afford to do so but sir 
that's ridiculous it's a fact anyhow but i can't get out of it and of course a fellow must have a horse must he well i didn't when i was your age and what was more i lived on my pay of course that's impossible no not impossible although it was very hard in these days now that the pay is so much better it can be done quite comfortably comfortably why it doesn't pay one's wine bills indeed that must be very awkward for you jolly awkward i can assure you but for the mater i should have been in a bad way even as it is trev hesitated at this point yes said the colonel quietly even as it is well you see father replied trevor who was very nervous although he tried to speak carelessly army pay is a mere bagatelle and no fellow of any position can afford to live on it indeed i thought it very good especially when it is compared to that which i received as a lieutenant however you say your mother helped you yes she did i i couldn't have done without it trev my boy said the colonel do you realize that you have made things very hard for your mother how can that be of course i know you are well off i'm not badly off although anything but a rich man when i left home i thought i had arranged liberally for all expenses but as you know the cost of everything has more than doubled that was why your mother found it hard to send you money and why she couldn't send john on to the varsity in fact the boy went to work in order to keep things going of course i'm sorry remarked trev still jack wouldn't mind he's never so happy as when he's mucking about with engineering things but about those bills of mine what bills you mean that for the horse yes that and other things the truth is i'm jolly hard up and the man at cox's wasn't at all decent do you mean that you are in debt of course i am and trev coolly cut off the end of an expensive cigar you see he went on a man must live like a gentleman and you can't get a decent bottle of champagne for less than champagne interrupted the colonel do subalterns buy champagne when they belong to the set i'm in whatever the colonel might have said was cut short by the appearance of a porter behind his chair colonel trelawney sir yes you are wanted on the telephone sir this way please the colonel followed the man to the telephone booth yes who is it he called it's i john was the reply yes my boy is anything the matter do you think you could catch the midnight train home tonight, dad i wish you could the midnight train home yes i think you ought to be here why is anything wrong i'm afraid there's a lot wrong can you hear me yes yes go on tell me quickly it's eleanor and peg yes what of them they went out directly you had left last night and didn't come home till the early hours of the morning unfortunately i had to be at the works early this morning i've i've something rather important on there when i got home this evening i found they'd been out all day they haven't come home yet and your mother asked the colonel she's terribly bothered replied the boy you see perhaps there's nothing serious interrupted the colonel from what your mother says they've often done that kind of thing yes i know but mother had to go out for an hour or so this afternoon and when she got back she went to their rooms and she says that nearly all their things are gone their things 
yes their clothes and that sort of thing and what do you think i hardly know what to think but i'm afraid they've left home you mean for good that's what i fear and have you done anything yes sir first of all i went to camden town where that fellow barnes's people live well it was a bit awkward i hardly knew what to say to them or how to ask questions but i felt sure they knew something did they tell you anything no i could get nothing definite but i feel certain they knew that peg had left home they are a funny lot but they would tell me nothing i did my best sir and i don't think i gave myself away then i tried to find out about eleanor about eleanor yes i went to that club where the woman cory is a member but she wasn't there and no one seemed to know when she was likely to turn up just as i was leaving however she came to the club and i asked her point-blank if she'd seen my sister and had she she wouldn't tell me but i'm sure she had i asked her a lot of questions which she tried to evade and that's as far as i've got i thought you ought to know i'm sorry if i've made a mess of it i'm sure you've done everything you could do my boy have you told your mother yes sir i've told her everything she's all right but she badly wants you of course you understand yes i understand tell her i'll catch the midnight train comfort her all you can my boy yes sir don't worry we'll manage somehow when the colonel hung up the receiver he stood for a minute like a man stunned then a great wave of pity passed over him little peggy the child he had romped and played with the happy turbulent wilful yet loving little thing he had so often put to bed to run away from home for the sake of a fellow like that no no it couldn't be true and yet how could her disappearance be explained why had both the girls taken their belongings they must have determined on this for some time had he done right had he made sufficient allowance for the new spirit of the age ought he not to have been less firm more gentle more lenient with them mightn't things have turned out better if he had let them drift with the tide but no that was impossible he would have been violating everything sacred and true if he had countenanced what he felt to be wrong fatally and inherently wrong even although the attitude he had adopted had ended so disastrously he could not repent of it poor little alice he said aloud and tears came to his eyes and a sob to his throat as the words escaped him it will break her heart but no it can't be true and john will do all that's possible while i am away anyhow thank god for john he's a fine lad the thought of john made him remember that his eldest son was waiting for him yes they had been discussing trevor's extravagant ideas when he had been called to the phone what a difference in the two boys you've been a long time away sir remarked trev on his return nothing the matter i hope the colonel did not reply he would have liked to have taken his eldest son into his confidence but he felt he could not perhaps their conversation during dinner had not been of a nature to inspire confidence i find it necessary for me to go home to-night he said presently there are matters in london that require immediate attention oh is that all remarked trev but your train won't start for another hour and i would like to settle up these money matters before you go i wish you could let me have a fairly fat check what do you mean by a fat check a thousand would put me quite straight replied trev i could then pay the fellow for the horse and settle up a few other things it wouldn't leave me much but at any rate i should owe nothing trev remarked the colonel 
do you realize what you are saying i think i do sir replied the son with an uneasy laugh i have my doubts about it your mother has given me an idea of what she has already advanced you and now you coolly ask for a thousand pounds do you know that up to now you have cost me more than all the others put together is that fair do you think that's the right way to put it sir i know of no other way to put it do you know your extravagance has robbed john of the chance of going to oxford that in order to keep you he has had to work in a motor engineer's shop look at the matter squarely i am anything but a rich man but what i have i hope to divide equally among my children if i were to give you a cheque for a thousand pounds as you desire i should simply rob from the others by that amount would that be fair trev was silent what you ask is simply impossible went on the colonel impossible sir impossible i can't spare the money trev muttered something about the absurdity of such a statement the truth is my son i can just afford you an allowance of one hundred and fifty pounds a year no more you must make that do thousands of fellows in your position have only their pay to live on and they do with it you will have to get rid of your silly extravagant notions that kind of talk simply drives a fellow to borrow from his tailors or from the money-lenders remarked the son of course if a fellow hasn't decent pride that is the kind of thing he would do retorted the colonel anyhow that's the position but what am i to do these people to whom i owe money are constantly dunning me besides what about the horse i don't want to be unreasonable said the colonel although i confess to being a bit worried do you know that your brother lives on the wages he earns and won't take a penny more oh i'm sick of hearing about him snapped trev mother used to be always telling me what the pattern boy did besides he's cast in that mould he was always contented to be a day labourer but if a man has the tastes of a gentleman he must pay for them certainly if he can replied the father tartly but in my opinion a gentleman whatever his tastes should live within his means i am awfully sorry to have to talk like this on our first day together but it is always well to get a right understanding this is what i am prepared to do if you will send me these bills you owe i will see what can be done with them awfully decent of you i'm sure sir of course that includes the horse and trev spoke eagerly no was the reply you can't afford to keep a horse but but i say sir when trev left his father half an hour later he was much subdued i had no idea he would take it like that he reflected dash it he doesn't give a man a chance and the worst of it is he knows the ropes so thoroughly that he's always putting one in the wrong as for the colonel he made his way to millbay station with a sad heart the day to which he had looked forward so eagerly was ending in gloom his conversation with his eldest son had been anything but satisfactory but it was not trev who was his chief trouble just now after all the question of money might be met but how could he deal with the horror which john's message had called up all through the night he tried to fasten upon some plan of action but he seemed to be met with a no thoroughfare on every road he took he was not so much troubled about eleanor as about peggy he believed that john had been right in his summing up of eleanor's character and that she was not likely to come to any irrevocable harm she was cold calculating and not easily moved by sudden influences but peggy was different she was younger 
she was passionate and wilful and she was careless about consequences how can i save her he asked himself again and again how can i make her see that she's ruining her life he might be too late even now his child might have taken steps that would be fatal god help me he prayed again and again help me to save my little maid at length the train swept into the london terminus and he had just signalled a taxi-driver when he felt a touch on his arm john cried the colonel this is good of you is is there anything new not much replied john but i thought you wouldn't mind my coming to meet you End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of prodigal daughters by joseph hawking this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by kate fallis chapter thirteen the girls take french leave in spite of everything the colonel could not help feeling comforted the thought that his youngest boy should get out of his bed at five o'clock in the morning so that he might be at paddington to meet him at six helped him to bear his trouble he was not an emotional man under ordinary circumstances but he was touched by this act of kindness if all of them were like him he reflected what a joy life would be get in my boy he said as he stood by the door of the taxi after you dad i say it was beastly of me to ring you up like that but i thought it was best of course it was best have you heard nothing since they were sitting side by side now and the conveyance was leaving the station no i've heard nothing i think mother has though why do you think so i saw her reading something which i thought she did not wish me to see but i'm sure of nothing have you seen your mother this morning yes dad i was hoping i'd get away without her knowing but she heard me dressing and called me to her i'm afraid she didn't sleep last night she asked me if i was coming to meet you but she said nothing particular she only told me to hurry back she is plucky of course she is but why do you say so now she told me to tell you not to bother about her for she would be all right the colonel sat in silence i say dad i'm awfully sorry for you said john that's good of you perhaps after all it may not be so bad as we fear let's hope not was the boy's reply after which nothing more was said until they reached home no sooner had the colonel passed through the door than he saw his wife evidently john was right when he said that she had passed a sleepless night her face was pale and worn while her eyes were swollen she did not speak at her husband's appearance but rushed to him and began to sob convulsively it's good of you to be up to meet me and the colonel tried to speak cheerfully there there my little wife you see i've got back safe and sound wait a minute she whispered i shall be better directly there and she wiped her eyes vigorously i'm all right now come and get some breakfast you must be tired and hungry everything is ready i saw to it myself no we are not going to discuss anything till you've done justice to the kidneys and bacon you saw trev how's he looking john be careful about the coffee it's very hot evidently she had made up her mind to be cheerful and although her heart was heavy she seemed bent on making her husband's homecoming glad indeed she revealed herself in a new light 
dearly as the colonel loved her he could not help owning to himself that she was doubtless weak and easily overruled by the stronger will of her children but now he felt that for the time they had changed places it was she who sought to drive away gloomy thoughts it was she who tried to make him think of pleasant things no she said after they had finished breakfast you must not bother your head about me besides i can perhaps help you more than you think anyhow it's not me that you must trouble about i shall be strong enough to bear everything what do you mean by that alice asked the colonel shall i leave asked john as he saw his mother hesitate no my dear she replied you don't want to keep anything from him do you turning to her husband certainly not replied the colonel and by the way my boy do you think you could be spared from the works to-day i had thought of that dad and i'm sure i could the truth is there is something i wanted to tell you i i asked mr davenport yesterday if he could let me have a little slack time nothing wrong i hope oh no nothing of that sort but you had so many things to think about that i did not want to bother you with my jobs besides there's no hurry everything's going a one that's right but you have something to tell me alice what is it it's not much and and i hope you won't misunderstand but eleanor has sent me a letter it came by the late post last night let me see it please i hate giving it to you but please please my darling don't think i agree with her i was thinking about it in bed last night i imagined from what you said just before you left for plymouth that i thought you a little hard and unreasonable with the girls i don't i don't see how you could have been kinder or more considerate i wanted to tell you that before showing you her letter i'm afraid it's my fault too i ought to have kept a firmer hand on them years ago i ought to have taught them differently she passed him a letter as she spoke which the colonel opened with an anxious look in her eyes dear mother he read you will have guessed from the fact that our things are gone that i have decided to leave hampstead the truth is i object to being treated as a child and to have my life interfered with as though i had no personality of my own i don't suppose you will be greatly shocked or surprised as i've told you pretty plainly what i meant to do in a way i'm sorry to leave you but it will be a relief to get away from a place where the man who calls himself my father now rules it was bad enough before he came it is unbearable now i hesitated some time before taking this step and considered the advisability of staying at hampstead and treating his petty and absurd restrictions with utter indifference but i have decided differently i should be bored to tears with constant bickerings and quarrels besides his attitude is a continual irritation not only do i cordially detest him but his evident belief that he has the right to interfere with my life and to say whom i shall have for my friends is a bit too much that is why i am going to think my own thoughts live my own life and earn my own living colonel trelawney may be able to command a number of slaves in a barrack-yard but his belief that he has the right to command me is too absurd for words it will be no use your trying to find out where i am neither need you imagine that i shall come back like a prodigal child to ask forgiveness i know how to take care of myself and in any case i would rather die than be obedient to a petty tyrant whose ideas surely had their birth in the ark so don't expect to see me again eleanor 
the colonel read this epistle through very carefully and then after looking very grave for some time went through it a second time john has not seen this he asked turning to his wife mrs trelawney shook her head read it john and he passed it to his son john read it through but made no remark what do you think of it my boy there's not much to think about is there remarked john i've heard her say all this dozens of times in different ways until i'm about tired of it is that all you have to say yes except that eleanor is a little more considerate than lots of other girls i've heard of you remember i told you about some girls i met at a dance they informed me that they hadn't said anything to their people about what they had done they just left their homes and left their people to think what they liked eleanor has had the decency to write to mother call it decency do you remarked the colonel please don't mistake me dad the whole thing is horrible according to my idea but there we are i simply say that eleanor is no worse than thousands of other girls and better than some she did have the common decency to write to mother it's a shameful letter said mrs trelawney i could never have believed it if i hadn't seen it to talk of her father like that she's never said a word about peggy remarked the colonel presently no but i've no doubt she knows where peg is said john why do you think so of course they've been hand in glove in this besides didn't you notice the beginning of her letter you will have guessed from the fact that our things are gone of course they went away together do you imagine they are together now depends upon barnes replied john you have barnes address don't you yes here it is dad i'm not disposed to take such a hopeless view of things as i did why because whatever else eleanor is she's got brains and she's as cold as an icicle she'll not allow peg to make too much of a fool of herself in her way she's fond of the kid too then you think if we can find out where eleanor is we shall find peg at the same time i don't say that still i'm sure she'll see to it that barnes does the straight thing in so far as such a fellow can do the straight thing perhaps you are right let's hope so anyhow will you ring for a taxi we'll go and see the barnes family again oh i am glad you are back cried mrs trelawney when john had left them and i'm sure you have done right at first i was afraid lest you had been hard on them and that perhaps you had not made enough allowance for the topsy-turvy way in which everything is looked at but i'm not troubling half so much now i'm glad of that alice lester you've done right i know i've been weak and yielding but i can see now that it needed a strong hand like yours to have let them go on in the way they were going was ruinous even if you can't find them i shall still know that you did right the colonel looked grave i know how you feel went on mrs trelawney you are thinking most of peg you are afraid you'll not be able to save her from that man but even if you can't it'll be all right in the end if i can't save her from him i don't know how anything can be right remarked the colonel gloomily yes i know the thought is dreadful but my dear husband i'm old-fashioned enough to believe in god i may have been a foolish mother but i've tried to do right and more than that this home has been a christian home both you and i taught our children to pray we taught them to believe in god and in jesus christ and that will not be in vain let's never forget that no alice we will not forget that replied the colonel thank you for reminding me 
i was in danger of forgetting it i know they seem utterly irreligious now i know they've been carried away by the spirit of the age they've forgotten god and his commandments they've forgotten filial love and duty but i can never believe that our prayers and our example will be in vain they'll feel their need of us some day but i do hope you'll find them and bring them home it may be they will refuse even if i do find them said the colonel but i'll do everything in my power and we have john went on mrs trelawney yes he's a great fellow alice i only wish trev were more oh you've told me nothing about trev is he all right what did you think of him taxi will be here in a quarter of an hour informed john entering the room that's right said the colonel almost cheerfully his wife's words had lifted the gloom somewhat her simple faith had made him feel almost hopeful by the way john he went on you said you had something to tell me what is it i'm afraid it would bother you now sir you will be anxious about other things it wouldn't bother me a bit my boy i've made all the plans i can about this business and i want to know what you have in your mind i'm interested in all you do and as i told you several days ago i want you to remember that everything in your life is of interest to me so speak freely my dear lad he felt very tenderly towards his son just then his heart had gone out to the lad from the first and he saw in him a son in whom he could rejoice but there was more than that now john had shown himself so thoughtful so clear-headed so eager to help him and with such good feeling that he felt more than ever drawn towards him here at all events was a child after his own heart and he helped to atone for the others of course it may all end in nothing said john shyly very probably it will but mr davenport thinks a lot of it and says it may revolutionize motor engineering i've been years at it sir at what my boy it's what i call an automatic gear changer sir of course it isn't complete yet but i believe i've got the idea an automatic gear changer queried the colonel yes john's shyness had now gone i wish there were time for me to show you it's down in the cellar no one knows about it but mr davenport and myself and i wouldn't let him see it until i'd finished some of the parts but he's been awfully kind and tremendously keen it's this way sir when i learnt to drive a car at first i was awfully bothered with gear changing it seemed such a nuisance every time the thing had to go up hill to be obliged to change the gear it seemed so clumsy too first you have to jam down the clutch and then you have to get your gear through a gate for your second or third or fourth speed i was always a bit keen on mechanism and i thought how grand it would be if something could be invented whereby the gear would change itself automatically according to the burden on the engine splendid splendid cried the colonel enthusiastically and do you think you have managed it my boy i want to show you how far i've got replied john the thing is down in the cellar you see i fixed up a workshop down there and i've often been busy there of a night i wanted to tell you about it before but i hadn't got far enough yesterday however i had a chat with mr davenport and he was awfully kind to me in what way he told me he thought a great deal of the idea and as things were not so pressing just now i might take a little more time at it that is why he won't be surprised if i don't turn up to-day awfully good of davenport responded the colonel and of course i'll have a look at it the first moment i can spare i had no idea you had fixed up a workshop 
little as the boy suspected it he was helping his father greatly the colonel was troubled beyond words by what had taken place and although he professed a greater interest in john's schemes than he really felt the very fact that his boy confided in him comforted him a few minutes later they were on their way to camden town in order to interview the barnes family End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of prodigal daughters by joseph hawking this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by kate fallis chapter fourteen the colonel visits camden town this is the place dad the taxi drew up before a shabby house in a shabby street in spite of the spring morning the place looked dirty and comfortless the colonel paid the driver dismissed the cab and knocked at the door it's just eight o'clock he reflected looking at his watch we ought to find every one home the door was opened by a shabby genteel-looking woman who was fast approaching fifty years of age thirty years before she might have been a pretty girl of the doll-like and characterless type now she was faded and untidy apparently she had left her breakfast to admit them the clatter of teacups as well as the sound of feminine voices was plainly to be heard in a room close by while the smell of fried bacon pervaded the narrow passage the colonel noticed that the oilcloth on the floor was dirty while the cheap hat-stand had lost two of its pegs oh it's you again is it remarked the woman looking at john yes mrs barnes replied the boy this is my father i hope you will excuse my calling so early mrs barnes remarked the colonel but i wanted to see your son i thought if i came at this hour i might catch him before he went to business my son isn't at home replied mrs barnes i haven't seen him since yesterday morning she seemed rather awed by the colonel's presence although there was a look of lurking antagonism in her eyes i'm sorry for that replied the colonel but perhaps you can give me a few minutes of your time john noticed that the chatter of voices in the back room had ceased doubtless there were eager listeners to the conversation i'm afraid i'm rather busy this morning remarked mrs barnes my young ladies haven't gone to town yet and, and we are without a servant just now i'm so sorry replied the colonel politely servants are a difficult problem aren't they but perhaps you could spare me just five minutes mrs barnes seemed rather in a dilemma on the one hand she was evidently desirous to invite the colonel to stay but on the other she looked furtively around as though she were under orders at that moment however two girls came into the passage from the back room and eagerly looked towards mrs barnes this is colonel trelawney edith my dear he's called to see jim ask him into the drawing-room mother replied edith in her best manner good morning colonel trelawney this is indeed a pleasure it's very kind of you to say so replied the colonel i'm afraid i'm taking an unpardonable liberty but i wanted to see your brother particularly edith was evidently dressed for her day's work she was a rather well-formed girl and knew the value of good clothes you must excuse the disorder remarked miss barnes as she opened the door of a stuffy apartment which she had designated the drawing-room 
but as mother told you she like every one else had servant difficulties and i'm afraid everything is very untidy of course you gentlemen don't understand but no doubt mrs trelawney would is she well the colonel took no apparent notice of miss barnes question who immediately went on speaking we used to live in a much better style she volunteered but when dear papa died we had to economize these things do happen don't they jim told us what a beautiful house you had when he came home on sunday night and when will your brother be back asked the colonel there's no knowing tittered miss barnes uneasily jim is not one who does things by halves he goes the whole hog he does of course he gets good money and naturally at a time like this he'll make it fly weren't you awfully surprised the colonel was nonplussed he was not sure how much these people knew and he wanted to feel his way carefully jim was always like that went on miss barnes when he wanted a thing he always had a way of getting it of course you know all about it i'm afraid i must ask you to explain said the colonel about the wedding simpered miss barnes at least we supposed it's this morning but he hasn't told us anything definite but i've seen it coming on for a long time peggy and jim have been sweet on each other for months and i suppose they've taken the bit between their teeth and gone off and done it this morning after all why shouldn't they you can never be young but once i dare say there was a romance in your marriage colonel and miss barnes looked into the colonel's face with her most ingratiating smile edith edith whispered a voice outside yes emily i'm coming in a minute there's not a minute to spare persisted the voice you know how strict he is miss edith barnes was evidently annoyed at this interruption but she managed to control her features i'm afraid i must leave you colonel and mr john your name is john isn't it i've heard jim and peggy speak of you so often that i almost think of you as a relation well i suppose we shall be relations now and see a lot of each other emily come in this is colonel trelawney and john you don't mind my forgetting the mister do you are you fond of dancing of course the season's over but i say that dancing's good at any time of the year especially if you have nice partners and this time it was john who was honoured by her smiles we must go edith persisted emily we're late as it is then we'll be late there's plenty of jobs open but i suppose i'd better go your girls know what it is colonel trelawney eleanor worked as a typist during the war while peg went to munitions we're all in the same box you see and there's no disgrace in work she said this in rather defiant tones as though she wanted to claim equality with the trelawney family i'm still in the dark as to your meaning said the colonel am i to understand that your brother is being married this morning to your peggy at least we suppose so yesterday morning jim hinted that he expected to to become attached to your family in twenty-four hours we haven't seen him since so we are sure of nothing but jim is such a hustler that we expect it's all over by this time jim never loses any time then you knew of his intentions yesterday when my son called remarked the colonel sternly the barnes family laughed uneasily why didn't you tell him what you knew then persisted the colonel oh no tittered edith you wouldn't expect us to spoil sport would you we're not that sort i see very little sport in it 
was the reply your son knew that i objected very strongly to to this friendship and what if you did surely it was your girl's affair besides what is there to object to miss barnes was doubtless angered by the colonel's remark and thought it best as she told her mother afterwards to let him have it straight to say the least of it he replied you naturally knew that i should be interested in what my daughter proposed to do yes and you insulted jim on wednesday replied emily who had less control over herself than her sister jim told us he said you treated him as if he was dirt and then told the servant to show him out of the club of course jim wouldn't stand that he's too much spirit so he took his own line oh i don't mince words jim's a gentleman he is he was an officer just as you are you admitted him to your house on sunday and treated him like an equal and then on wednesday you talked to him as though he were a dog we are as good as you are do you think we mind what you say of course we knew what was in jim's mind when your son called yesterday but we wouldn't tell him anything if we had he'd have tried to stop the wedding it seems to me you don't know much retorted the colonel he saw that the second miss barnes was in a passion and would be likely to speak freely don't we snapped the girl but don't think i'm going to tell you i'm not such a fool as that what is there to tell persisted the colonel now emily mind what you are saying warned edith i don't care a button what i say retorted the girl it makes me sick when people treat us as inferiors i can see what he wants plain enough he's hoping that the wedding hasn't taken place and if we tell him what jim's plans are he may be in time to stop it but catch me she's not much of a catch anyhow but i hope jim will marry her if only to spite him come to think of it though i don't care whether he does or not there now emily we must go now and no good ever comes of hard words and edith again smiled ingratiatingly at the colonel of course we don't know anything jim's a close one he is and goes his own way good morning colonel of course you're just a little bit shocked but like as anything it'll turn out all right good morning john i hope we shall be good friends and see a lot of each other won't you come to supper some night a minute later the girls were in the street but the colonel and john still remained in the drawing-room the drama was not played out yet now mother mind you don't give yourself or jim away they heard one of the girls say on the doorstep and this made the colonel hope for revelations i'm sure i feel for you sir remarked mrs barnes as she again entered the room i don't believe in these runaway marriages what i say is go to church and do the thing in a christian way but there what could jim do you didn't treat him fair sir i must say that when he came home on sunday night he was as pleased as anything and i'm sure my girls were hungering to take peggy to their hearts as a sister that was what made him so mad at the way you spoke to him on wednesday then he told you what he intended to do on wednesday night asked the colonel it's not for me to say what jim said was mrs barnes guarded reply you see you don't give me a chance remarked the colonel a chance for what asked the woman eagerly the colonel was silent do you mean she went on that you'd you'd make the best of it if they owned up is that your idea mrs barnes oh i'm all for doing things in a lawful proper way my poor husband was a lawyer's clerk and a regular stickler for law and order you should see what a beautiful handwriting he wrote 
well as i was saying if only things could have come off in a proper way how nice it would have been the wedding could have took place at your house the girls could have got new frocks the young people could have had a father's blessing so to speak with say a thousand pounds to set them up in their new home and then the two families could have become friendly like that's what we should have liked sir i have no doubt you would remarked the colonel dryly yes and why couldn't it be now persisted mrs barnes who did not catch the intonation of his voice you mean that they should get married from my house asked the colonel but mrs barnes was not to be caught she had been warned by her daughters and she was evidently afraid of them i don't know about now she replied after a pause my jim's a high-spirited boy he is and as emily said you insulted him on wednesday night and he declared he'd make you pay for it and there's no knowing what jim will do when his blood's up he's like all the barneses in that way the girls are just the same they won't stand being spoken to by anybody more than one place they've left during the war because the foreman spoke sharp to them we're not going to stand any cheek from any one mother they've said to me and they won't that's what makes it so hard for me yes i should think you have rather a hard life mrs barnes remarked the colonel sympathetically hard sir you've no idea how hard i'm nothing but a servant here as i've said many and many's the time yes girls are a great trouble aren't they trouble you may well say so but what can i do jim and the two girls keep the house so to speak they go out when they like and come in when they like and i daren't speak a word as for my jim he's a regular gentleman he is as you doubtless saw yourself of course you knew that your son had persuaded my sister to leave her home and john's question came out suddenly do you think that was a gentlemanly thing to do what else could he do when the colonel was so unreasonable retorted mrs barnes tisn't as though we were a common family i think it's the action of a cad remarked john keeping his eyes steadily on the woman's face cad retorted the woman shrilly cad cad yourself for saying such a thing and i almost hope he won't marry her either at least if her father won't she ceased speaking suddenly as though she were afraid of saying too much remember there's such a thing as law said john and my sister's not of age yet do you know it is a criminal act for a man to persuade a girl to leave her home oh she replied you are trying to come that dodge over me are you well go to the law jim persuaded her to leave home did he well i'll warrant she didn't need much persuading she's as sweet as honey on him she was and jim wanted to do the straight thing he did well if he didn't your hoity-toity family have only got yourselves to blame my other sister will protect her said john still closely watching the woman's face even if your son is a blackguard my sister has friends they that live longest will see most retorted mrs barnes and now out you go you'll get nothing from me and my son isn't a blackguard either he wanted to do the thing straight but i don't blame him whatever he does after the way the colonel treated him when the trelawneys reached the street the colonel's face was drawn and haggard john my boy he said you had a purpose in speaking to that woman as you did i didn't like the looks on the girls faces remarked the boy but surely you don't think no sir i don't replied john after a silence but i'm sure the fellow's a rotter i still have faith that she may be with eleanor 
but how can we find eleanor i think we'd better clear the ground first how by finding barnes how can we do that for one thing we can go to the place where he works you have the address haven't you yes that was a good thought of yours my boy we'll go straight away ah there's a taxi the colonel did not speak a word during the drive from camden town to eight bywell street ghastly thoughts haunted his mind thoughts which made him look years older can i speak to the manager he asked of a clerk as they entered a rather shabby-looking office certainly sir said a man stepping forward of course you want a house or flat they are difficult to get just now but luckily we have a few on our books no replied the colonel i am not in want of a house thank you i am come on a rather personal matter you employ a young man named barnes don't you the man looked at the colonel sharply do you know him he asked i know of him replied the colonel i want to speak to him he works here doesn't he he did was the reply but he hasn't been here since wednesday night he'll get the rough side of my tongue when he does come back and probably the sack then you don't know where he is i know he's greatly inconveniencing me that's what i know fancy leaving me like this without word of warning when he had one or two very promising prospects on hand some other firm will get them i expect then you don't know when he'll be back i've had a hint that he'll be back to-morrow morning but i don't know i was never treated in such a way before fancy leaving me like that just as the colonel was leaving a young man rushed to open the door as he did so he slipped a piece of paper in his hand i think i can tell you something you ought to know the colonel read i shall leave the office for lunch at twelve forty five end of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of Prodigal Daughters by Joseph Hawking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kate Fallis. Chapter Fifteen: The Search for the Runaways. Have you any idea as to the meaning of this? And the Colonel passed the slip of paper to John. I expect the fellow is a friend of Barnes replied john at any rate it will be wise for us to be here early i think so too meanwhile we'll try to find eleanor how will you start about it sir like you i can't help connecting her with that woman cory i feel that she aided and abetted her i think so too but as i told you on the phone last night she would say nothing she absolutely refused to tell me if she knew where my sister had gone or to give me her own address she would still there may be ways of finding out at any rate we'll go to the club you visited last night do you think she had any money inquired john i asked your mother about that she doesn't know she says that eleanor earned a good salary during the war and for some time after but she's no idea whether she spent it all or not it seems however that she had her quarter's dress money about a month ago and your mother is not aware of her spending any considerable amount since probably she has a few pounds with her why do you ask as i told you dad i have little fear of eleanor i feel sure she can take care of herself she can earn her own living too i was told while she was working in that government office that any business house would be glad to give her two hundred pounds a year my idea is that if she has a few pounds as you say she'll get lodgings 
and then look out for a job i only hope peg is with her i say dad i'm awfully sorry for you thank you my boy i do feel this badly even yet i can't realize that those girls have left home and that peg is in danger of ruining herself for life it's simply horrible to think of we are so much in the dark too and it may be that even now that child may be at some registry office getting married to that cad just think of it the son of that woman the brother of those girls and that may not be the worst of it i don't like the way those women talked my boy nor i still i don't fear what's in your mind dad i'm sure that eleanor will make barnes do the straight thing i believe barnes is afraid of her too of course i know he's a bounder and a rotter and capable of doing any dirty thing but i've faith in eleanor i hope you're right john but how can one know it may be that while eleanor was with this woman cory the fellow was alone with peg and may have persuaded her to any madness i'm almost mad myself as i think of it but i can't understand eleanor getting under the influence of that woman cory and people of her kind as you know she openly denounced marriage while eleanor seemed to agree with her and peg heard her while barnes laughed good god why did i allow such people to enter my house i can't bear this any longer where are we they were seated in a taxicab as they spoke and were on their way to tamsin cory's club we're just there dad this is the place no replied the girl who was seated at a desk in a kind of office we don't know where miss cory is this in reply to the colonel's enquiry will she be here to lunch do you think i don't think so she is seldom here to lunch as a matter of fact we have very little accommodation for that kind of thing then perhaps you could tell me where she lives no replied the girl we never do that sort of thing it's against the rules of the club to give any members address but if you'd like to write her a letter it'll be sent on to her immediately i'm afraid that wouldn't be of any use replied the colonel you see i want to see her at once on a very important matter if you could strain a point and give me her address impossible besides it would be no good interrupted the girl she's never at home during the day she's nearly always at her work let me see and the colonel spoke like one trying to recall something i've forgotten where her place of business is is she a friend of yours she was at my house last sunday night then you should know she's a journalist she's the counsellor of new women on the women of to-morrow she's aunt mary on the butterfly and she acts as secretary for liberty equality and fraternity a busy woman remarked the colonel yes she is and she's almost sure to be at the office of one of those papers of course i'm not sure i hear that dulotsky the great russian bolshevist is in london she may be interviewing him she's often used for that kind of job anyhow i can't give you the address of her flat although i can send on letters here's one i'm sending to her now i've just readdressed it that's a funny stamp said john who had taken no part in the conversation but on whom the girl had cast sundry smiles what nationality does it belong to i think it's russian 
replied the girl miss cory gets letters from all sorts of funny places does she though asked john smiling at the girl i'm awfully interested in stamp collecting do be a sport now and let me look at it it's not a love letter tittered the girl tamsin doesn't believe in that sort of thing how do you know asked the boy with a laugh how do you know she hasn't a sweetheart somewhere but that's not the point i want to look at the stamp what sort of stamps do you use when you write love letters asked the girl with a giggle i only kiss the place where the stamp ought to be and then the postman takes it for love for shame to talk like that when your father's listening and the girl winked there look at it if you like john's quick eyes caught the address at a glance two fifty nine black inn mansions it's a nice stamp remarked john i must ask miss cory to give it to me she's often here of a night replied the girl but this week i'm not here after five o'clock then i shall not come was john's reply you seem to have some experience in getting on with girls remarked the colonel when they got outside she was making eyes at me all the time you were talking replied the boy that's why i butted in anyhow we've got the address perhaps eleanor's there let's go and see cried the colonel eagerly but he was doomed to disappointment when they arrived at black inn mansions a large block of buildings made up of innumerable small cheaply furnished rooms he discovered that miss tamsin cory's apartments were vacant he discovered that she shared certain rooms with two other women and that the three had lived together some time neither of these women moreover appeared to correspond in the slightest degree with either eleanor or peggy neither could they discover that the girls had been there what now asked the colonel with a sigh when at length they had left black inn mansions the office of liberty equality and fraternity replied the boy but i don't think you'd better appear why because it's a revolutionary paper and you are a colonel in the army you stand for law and order and that paper stands for the opposite of course you're right replied the colonel but it does seem strange that such rags should be allowed have you ever seen a copy i saw one of mr davenport's men reading a copy replied john of course it's simply clotted rubbish but it seems to be read by a lot of hotheads it talks a great deal about our russian brothers speaks enthusiastically of the red flag damns what it calls capitalism and says how glorious it would be if we had communism in england i wonder the government allows it said the colonel as if thinking aloud of course i had heard something of industrial unrest in england but i had no idea before i came home that revolution was advocated publicly go to hyde park on a sunday afternoon laughed john anyhow let's go to these offices of this paper said the colonel almost feverishly the quest was in vain however when john inquired if miss cory was there he was informed that she was away doing work for the paper and beyond that he could get no information neither could they get any news of her at the offices of the women of to-morrow or the butterfly at each place it was a matter of no thoroughfare miss tamsin cory's movements seemed to be unknown for that matter the editor of the butterfly told the colonel that miss cory was seldom there 
it was true she wrote a column every week over the signature of aunt mary but that this column did not necessitate her presence at the office it's mainly answers to correspondence he was informed and is especially written for young girls miss cory is a good writer added the editor but she's rather given to discussing politics and that's no good for our readers and now we'd better go to bywell street said the colonel when they had failed to find miss cory all right dad we can about manage to get there by a quarter to one true to his promise the young man who had spoken to them appeared at the door of the house agents at the time he had mentioned colonel trelawney sir he queried yes i'm colonel trelawney was the reply my name's wilkins sir herbert wilkins i was in the kent buffs and i work at the same place as barnes the house agent's place yes sir and you know where he is now the colonel's voice was eager i don't say that quite sir but i think i do in a way you are a friend of barnes no sir not a friend you see barnes got a commission during the war and wears a large-sized hat as a consequence i dare say i might have had a commission too if i'd played up for it but i didn't anyhow barnes tries to play at being a swell which he isn't any one can see that but where is he now i'm coming to that i was in the office last wednesday when a letter came for barnes i took it to him and saw that it had the war office stamp on it barnes is a bit of a boaster and he told me it was from you sir he said you'd invited him to the army and navy club to dinner he told me too that he was going to marry your daughter and that he was going to settle things with you over a bottle of champagne indeed remarked the colonel dryly while john gave vent to some unparliamentary language of course i didn't believe it remarked wilkins although he asked me to go with him to the entrance of the club if i didn't trust his word well to tell you the truth i followed him and saw him go into the army and navy club but he'd been there only a few minutes when he came out again looking very black when he saw me he tried to make the best of it and said that the affair was settled i told him i didn't believe it and then he bet me ten pounds that the wedding would come off in a week this was outside the army and navy club perhaps a hundred yards away sir and then he went away sir but i didn't like the look on his face i know the kind of chap he is and how he's boasted that your daughter was in love with him i remember too sir that i'd seen your son in france captain trevor trelawney sir yes that's my son well sir remembering the kind of gentleman he was and reading of the kind of gentleman you were i couldn't believe you'd be willing to let your daughter marry barnes and then i got to thinking of the look on his face as he left the club and i was sure he'd heard nothing that pleased him there after that i had a feeling that something was wrong i've got a bit of sherlock holmes in my nature sir so i went to barnes house that same night yes yes interrupted the colonel eagerly they didn't seem pleased to see me sir which was a bit strange for at other times they especially barnes sisters have been very sweet on me before i'd been there long i could see that something important
portent was on and presently it leaked out that you had insulted him and as good as had him thrown out of the club i don't know how it was sir but the spirit of mischief seemed to possess me so i said with a laugh that's how the colonel invited you to dinner is it that's how you settled everything over a bottle of fizz barnes what about our ten pound bet this made him in a worse temper than ever and he seemed to lose all control over himself don't you make any mistake wilkins he said i'll drag the whole lot of em into the mud i'll not be insulted for nothing i've got my plans all made she'll not marry you against her father's will i says won't she and he laughed why she's fair gone on me she'll do anything i ask anything see i don't believe it i says the colonel's a gentleman and you can't make me believe that a family of that sort is going to get mixed up in that sort of thing a lot you know wilkins and there was an ugly look on his face as he spoke why both the girls is leaving home anyhow they can't stand the old man and eleanor has took a flat not a thousand miles from the holborn town hall now then and i know of a lit crib where i can take peggy i've only to hold up my finger and she'll come wilkins stopped in his recital at this juncture as though he found it difficult to proceed i hardly like telling you what followed sir he stammered tell me tell me everything cried the colonel well i told him straight i didn't believe it that it was all buncombe or that a family like yours sir would get mixed up with people like them at this the girls flared up they said that the barneses were as good as the trelawneys and then asked the colonel well i laughed jeeringly as you may say and told them i'd cut my wisdom teeth years before think of it i says think of the colonel owning you as a son-in-law it won't do barnes he'll be glad to he shouted almost white with passion you see sir he'd been drinking a bit and barnes is always free with his tongue at those times glad to tell that to the marines i jeered you don't believe it he says no i don't look here wilkins he says suppose i takes her away with me for a few days then suppose i go to the colonel and say i'm prepared to marry her if he'll do that thing handsome but if not then he looked at me like that and wilkins assumed a defiant look the colonel did not speak but his face had become blanched as if with great terror john however who had been listening intently to every word caught wilkins by the arm this was on wednesday night wasn't it yes wednesday night then why didn't you come to our house and tell us wait a bit replied wilkins i haven't finished yet when he said this i laughed again it's all moonshine i said why he asked because you haven't got the pluck to do it i replied haven't i he asked and then he seemed to think he'd said too much for after that he couldn't say a word the girls kept on talking about it however and seemed to be as good as sure that the wedding would take place soon that's all wilkins concluded i came away soon after and went to my diggings this young gentleman has asked me why i didn't go to your house and tell you about it i did think of it but it was no business of mine besides how could i go to your house late at night and tell such a story 
what would you have said and that wasn't all after i thought it over a bit i didn't believe it i've heard barnes and his family talk before he was always on with some girl or other and talked continually about rich girls who wanted to marry him have you finished asked the colonel very nearly sir as i said i laughed at the whole thing after i had left the barnes house but when i got to business yesterday morning and found that barnes didn't turn up i began to wonder especially was this so when our mr bristow came to me and asked me if i knew where he was of course i didn't say anything about what i'd heard but when this morning came and he didn't turn up i began to think there was more truth in it than i had admitted then you came into the office sir and i thought i recognized you i'd seen your photograph in the papers and i felt sure you were colonel trelawney you looked pale and worried too if you'll forgive me saying so and then when you asked after barnes i said to myself the blighter was serious after all then i scribbled that note sir for i felt you ought to know what i have told you and that's all that's all sir i'm afraid it won't help you much and i'm more sorry than i can tell that i didn't try to find out where you lived on wednesday night and told you all i had to tell then but really sir i didn't think it was serious even now i have my doubts whether there is anything in it i'm very much obliged to you anyhow said the colonel perhaps you wouldn't mind giving me your home address certainly sir thirty-two hope terrace camden town may i ask sir if there's anything wrong i don't know yet replied the colonel i hope not still i'm greatly obliged to you here's my card would you mind telephoning to me the moment you hear of barnes's whereabouts certainly sir you've not said a word about this to anyone no sir not a word then don't it shall be to your advantage not to and that reminds me that i've kept you from your lunch so i must claim the privilege of paying for it he passed a note into Wilkins's hand as he spoke, and then, returning the man's salute, he turned to his son. "'Well, my boy, what do you think of it?' "'That we have a great deal to think about, Dad. I suggest that we go to your club and go over everything point by point.' A few minutes later, father and son entered the Army and Navy Club together. End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of Prodigal Daughters by Joseph Hawking。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kate Fallis. Chapter 16 Eleanor Secures a Position while colonel trelawney was travelling from plymouth to london eleanor and peggy were sitting in an uncomfortably furnished room in a large block of buildings not far from the holborn town hall the former was very pale and much wrought upon except for her pallor however she showed very few signs of it she was quiet in her movements and spoke in a natural tone of voice eleanor was not given to excitement and she prided herself upon hiding her feelings she had on the previous day come to an important decision under the influence of tamson corey and others of her friends she had determined to leave home her anger with her father had been increased by what these women had said to her if you are willing to be a doormat tamson had said to her and have not enough spirit to stand up against a tyrant then you'll knuckle down to him but i hope you are not that kind of girl strike for liberty you can do very well for yourself without his help 
eleanor had been silent at this outburst even although she agreed with her friend she was not quite happy at the thought of it you say he is going to dictate to you as to all your doings went on tamson and that he has forbidden you to take me to your house because i march with the times i tell you my dear if you don't strike for liberty now you will never get it make a bold stand and he'll come to your terms tamson's influence over eleanor was very strong and eventually she went to a place of business in the city whose manager was acquainted with the head of the firm for which she had worked during the war ah miss trelawney said mr wakeham when eleanor was shown into his room glad to see you i wondered what had become of you since you left downey in spring i often told mr spring that i envied his possession of you i see however by the papers that your father has come home so i expect you'll not want another job on the other hand that is just why i have come to you eleanor replied what you want a place i want one very badly she replied then why didn't you stay on at downey and springs i was tired of it just for the moment she replied and mother did not want me to stay there any longer but surely now your father has come back he'll not want you to be working in the city look here mr wakeham eleanor said in a burst of confidence i am tired of the idea of staying at home what is there for a girl like me there and what future is there for me of course you will marry replied mr wakeham no thank you eleanor rejoined i hate the idea of marriage come come protested mr wakeham that won't do any one like you who has a dozen chaps running after her please mr wakeham interposed the girl please do not talk to me in that way i have determined to earn my own living and knowing that you were acquainted with the work i did at downey and springs i thought you might have an opening for me here in fact i heard you wanted a private secretary and you have come to ask for the post asked mr wakeham there was a suggestion of eagerness in his voice if you think i'll suit replied eleanor the man looked at her intently for a few seconds without speaking and he seemed to be thinking deeply my present secretary is leaving he admitted presently she is getting married but i am afraid i cannot offer you anything for a while and just at present secretaries are getting as thick as blackberries on a bramble bush i have come to you for the post anyhow replied eleanor again mr wakeham looked at her intently and made a mental note of the fact that she was a handsome girl very attractive almost fascinating he had been particularly struck with her while she had been at downey and springs and had been impressed by the fact that she had been spoken of there as a brilliant secretary what salary do you want he asked mr burnham told me when i left that i was worth two hundred a year replied eleanor oh but that was during the war replied mr wakeham quickly things are on a different footing now thousands of secretaries have been turned out from government offices and there is a slump in salaries his manner had changed towards her almost unconsciously while she had been at downey and springs she was the daughter of colonel trelawney who had worked there from patriotic motives but now she had put herself on a level with thousands of other girls what could you afford to give me asked eleanor it's a bit difficult to say what would you like 
i am going into a flat replied the girl that will cost me something going into a flat he asked eagerly yes may i ask why because i am tired of living at home and there was a tone in her voice which made mr wakeham reflect again the gallant colonel strict on discipline eh and he leered at her as he spoke i have decided to go into a flat was all the girl said in answer to this ah that puts a different complexion on it said mr wakeham reflectively i work my secretary pretty hard you know i'm not afraid of work replied eleanor when she left the office half an hour later it was on the understanding that she should commence to work on the following monday and mr wakeham looked at himself in the mirror with evident satisfaction perhaps this was the reason why she had been irritated and almost angry when rod ravenscroft had spoken to her about her friendships on her return home that day and now she sat alone with her sister in the shabbily furnished room she had taken in spite of her misgivings the romance and excitement of the situation still gave a glamour to the future she had at all events justified her position to her father and shown him that she was not to be trifled with peggy on the other hand seemed to have no misgivings whatever she was but a child scarcely eighteen and revelled in the thought of her liberty she had an interview with barnes and his love-making had been so emphatic that she was almost delirious in her joy think of it she cried won't he have a fit when he finds out eleanor made no reply older and more thoughtful than peggy she had sense enough to see the gravity of the situation added to this she was not altogether happy about barnes she instinctively felt his commonness and his lack of breeding and but for her father's insistence that peggy should have nothing more to do with him she might have tried to persuade her to give him up inexperienced as she was she felt that peggy was taking a grave step and she did not feel happy about it had they like thousands of other girls both left home simply with the determination to make their own living and had peggy succeeded in getting a situation equal to her own she would have had no qualms but she did not admire barnes and she felt vastly uncomfortable jim will be here first thing in the morning peggy said with a laugh of triumph do you still persist in that business eleanor asked of course i do laughed the other jim is getting the license and says he has got a nice little flat ready for us won't it make his lordship sit up when he knows it you are a fool peg there was bitterness in eleanor's voice that's all you know about it while you are plugging away in the city i shall be enjoying myself i tell you you will get tired of him insisted eleanor will i i am not that sort when i make up my mind i don't alter besides what business had he to insult jim i'll let him see that i am not a dog of the fetch and carry order ordered jim out of the club did he told him that if he came to the house he'd be kicked out i'll let him see besides we have agreed that we are both to go our own way all right assented eleanor somewhat wearily if you have made up your mind you have only i cannot do anything for you after your marriage who wants you to asked peggy 
i am able to take care of myself i can tell you and jim is so mad about me he'll do whatever i want him to the following morning eleanor had an appointment with tamsin corey she left the flat just before nine o'clock leaving peg alone in spite of their professed delight at having their liberty neither of them had slept much during the night and although eleanor would not admit it to herself she could not help comparing the shabby little cupboard of a bedroom with that of her own sleeping-room at hampstead however the glamour of the new situation still cast its spell upon her and she left to keep her appointment with tamsin in a confident if a somewhat defiant state of mind i shall be back in a couple of hours peg she said to her sister see that you don't make a fool of yourself while i am away what do you mean and there was a suggestion of anger in the younger girl's tones i am not going to stand any nonsense with barnes you know that's my affair snapped peggy i do not interfere with you and i'll not have you interfere with me why i might as well have stayed at home if you are going to try to pull the elder sister stunt besides i shall be all right i can take care of myself eleanor had not long left the flat when barnes appeared evidently that gentleman was slightly nervous and more than a little ill at ease he was neither so confident nor so deliriously happy as he had appeared on the previous night he too looked as though he had spent a wakeful night his eyes were a trifle bloodshot and his face had an unhealthy appearance still he entered jauntily and greeted peg very fervently my word little girl he said you look a little bit washed out this morning not quite up to the mark eh you're not frightened are you the old man is in plymouth you know have you got the license jim she asked at length no replied barnes i'm not so sure it's as easy as we thought what do you mean and she looked at him suspiciously mean well it's not so easy to explain you see we shall have to be very careful of course we shall we have discussed that a score of times have you found out anything new barnes looked at the girl intently there was a look in his eyes which she did not like there was something of shame in them but more of evil and determined as she was she felt a little afraid i suppose you have not got a drop of whisky in the place asked barnes i feel a bit below the mark this morning and and but of course you haven't girls are not like fellows in that direction tell me what you have in your mind jim persisted the girl why are you talking so strangely it's about the license you see the law is very strict and i could easily get into trouble get into trouble how well for one thing you are not eighteen yet and i have to give your age and as far as i can find out a girl is legally under her parents control until she is twenty-one don't you see do you mean that you want to back out asked peggy oh no no replied barnes quickly nothing of the sort back out indeed why peggy i love you like my own life i would do anything everything for you but still i do not understand persisted the girl oh it will be all right said barnes soothingly don't you fear little peg i'll make it all right you love me don't you i should not be here if i did not replied peggy evidently comforted by his warm protestations of love of course you would not that's why i feel as i do about this marriage business married or not we love each other just the same don't we little peg 
of course we do but tell me what you mean i was only thinking about what tamsin cory said last sunday night and again barnes looked uncomfortable after all what is marriage it is simply two people who love each other taking each other as man and wife it doesn't matter a bit about preachers and law and that kind of thing for that matter i regard myself as married to you now you love me and i love you and always shall love you as long as i have breath not all the marriage services in the world could make me love you more or make you more my wife than you are now don't you see little peg there kiss me again and tell me that you love me why are you saying all this she asked after he had been talking some time i'm saying it because it would be worse than death for me to give you up he cried with a strong affectation of fervour look here peg suppose the registrar refuses to grant the license because you are under age would you be willing to give me up but you can surely get over that jim i have often heard of girls of my age getting married yes if we had got your father's consent it would have been all right but you see he won't give it then we must do without it you told me we could you said all we had to do was to get a special license from the registrar and that nothing could stop us yes yes i know that is what i have hoped for and what i have dreamed about for oh peggy you are all the world to me but you have found out what kind of a man your father is by this time he is a regular military martinet and if i told a lie about your age and we got married he could bring us up for perjury and perhaps get me sent to prison on the other hand i could not wait until you are twenty-one i simply could not peggy when barnes left the flat half an hour later he was in a triumphant mood i've got her he cried she loves me so that she will do anything rather than lose me when i told her about the little flat i have rented and pictured our happiness together in it i saw tears of joy come into her eyes i may have a bit of trouble but i'll get my own way and then the colonel will come to my terms barnes spent the rest of the day avoiding his acquaintances and after dark that night made his way to his mother's house in camden town what are you doing here asked his sisters who were evidently much surprised to see him why should i not be here you told us you were going to get married to-day edith replied if you are you should be with your wife what about the little flat you've taken that's my own business replied barnes is it maybe it's our business too rejoined the sisters we know more than you think what do you know we know that if you are not careful the whole business will be stopped was edith's reply stopped how can it be stopped colonel trelawney was here this morning here before we had finished breakfast with his son and i can tell you this jim he means business why what did he say it wasn't so much what he said as the way he looked whatever you do will have to be done quickly he is not in a mood to be trifled with you didn't let on anything did you and there was anxiety in his voice of course we didn't tell us jim is the matter settled it soon will be he replied vaguely i have all my plans cut and dried whereby he'll be brought to heel all right then you are not married yet barnes was silent you need not be so close jim said edith there is nothing to make such a fuss about she is not much of a catch anyway and i believe you'll be sorry about the whole business before many months are over 
don't make any mistake trelawney'll never own you as a son-in-law won't he cried barnes defiantly i'll bet you a five-pound note he will what's that you say jim asked mrs barnes who entered the room at that moment nothing mother i'm only assuring the girls that i can look after my own business i came here to-night just to know if anything had turned up look here mother tell me what was said this morning when colonel trelawney came when barnes left the house half an hour later he expressed himself as more confident than ever that he was master of the situation End of chapter 16